Grab that Bible and turn it to 1 Timothy if you haven't done so already. And let's pray. Jesus, we open our hearts to You, to what You want to say, to the things You want to communicate to us today. Just fill us with Your understanding, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The book, 1st and 2nd Timothy, both written to a young man. Well, we don't know how young. Uh, named Timothy, but written by Paul. And we find that out the very first verse. If you look there, the first verse says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus our hope. This was in keeping with the way they wrote letters back in those days. Today, you and I write, dear so-and-so at the beginning, and then we finish the letter, and then we sign our name. It's easy to take out a letter out of an envelope today, turn it over and say, oh, this is from, you know, Aunt Clara. Or something like that. Well, back in those days, letters were rolled up. And it was quite inconvenient to have to unroll the whole thing to find out who wrote you the letter and then roll it back up again so that you could read it. So they always began their correspondence by giving the name first of the sender. And so he begins by saying, Paul. That's, and that's really all that was necessary. But he goes on to say, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the command of God. And that is an important statement. Paul recognized that his calling as an apostle was by the command of God. Now, you might think, well, okay, cool, but that's Paul. He was an apostle. How does that really relate to me? The fact of the matter is, Christians, every single one of us, every single person in this room and within the sound of my voice, we've all been given a ministry. There's something God has for you to do. The important thing to understand is what it is God has for you to do and to understand that it is His will and His purpose and not yours for you to accomplish that. Here's why that's important. If you're not convinced that God has called you into a particular ministry, when it gets hard, notice I didn't say if it gets hard, when it gets hard, you'll quit. If you are not convinced God called me here. Because, let me just say this, ministry will get hard. Uh, Difficulty and ministry go hand in hand. Now, a lot of other things go hand in hand with ministry too. Great joy, gratification, uh, you know, obedience. Those are all words that can apply to whatever area of ministry you've been given. But so does trouble. So does difficulty. You will have trouble. And if you aren't sure that God called you into that particular area of ministry, no matter what it is, I mean, it could be, you know, cleaning floors. It could be, you know, teaching Sunday school. It could, I don't know, whatever the ministry might be, whatever it is, you could be even called to the, to an area of pastoral ministry, maybe as an elder or, or something like that. But when you run into trouble, you're going to back away because you're going to think, wow, I, you know, I really wasn't looking for this. And you're going to stop and think to yourself, okay, did God call me to this or did I just kind of think of this? Or did I take this ministry position because they had a need or whatever all the reasons are? And then it starts getting hard and you kind of go, you know what? I don't need this. I don't need the grief or the challenges that come along with this because God didn't, I'm not convinced at all that God called me into this position. So why should I subject myself into this you know, garbage that goes along with whatever I'm doing. And so you just kind of go, okay, you know, I'm done. Now, but Paul, on the other hand, starts off by saying, I am an apostle by the command of God. I never asked to be an apostle. I didn't even want to be an apostle. I was, a, I was perfectly happy being a self-righteous Pharisee, frankly. And... I thought I knew it all and I thought I had my act together and, you know, God could have just left me in my uh, stupidity or whatever. But He brought me up short. He revealed Himself to me and then He called me into this position as an apostle. But I am here, make no mistake about it, by the command of God. It is by God's command. Here's where that makes the difference. About the first time you run into some challenges, some difficulties, some opposition. I don't, I don't want you to do it that way. I want you to do it this way. Or lack of appreciation or, or whatever you know, the thing may be. 
you're going, you know, it, it's going to be just as difficult to go through, but you're going to say, but you know what? This is where God called me. It's his calling. It's not mine. And so, yeah, I ran into some problems. I ran into some issues. I got some people here that are kind of, you know, getting into my face. And I got some people that don't really appreciate me very much. And I got this and I got that. But you know what? I'm called. This is what God called me to do. And so I'm just going to stick with it. I'm going to hang in there. I'm going to continue with the calling that God has upon my life. Because it's his calling. It's not mine. I didn't come up with this idea, you see. It's really, really important in whatever area of ministry the Lord may have you that you pray and say, Father, I need, you to, I need you to confirm this area of ministry to me. I need to know that I know that I know this is your calling in my life. Whatever it may be. Whether you think it's a big deal or whether you don't think it's a big deal. It doesn't matter. You need to be certain of that calling. You need to be able to, like Paul, say, I am here at the command of God. I want you to also notice here something else Paul says. He is an apostle not only by the command of God our Savior, but he says also of Christ Jesus our hope. Our hope. You know, I talk about this from time to time, but I never get tired of talking about it, to be completely honest, when I refer to the fact that Jesus Christ is our hope. And what that means is, after everything else in this life is stripped away, and I mean everything, We still have Jesus. Now, it's not a very fun thought when you to to consider the idea of everything in this life being stripped away. Family, friends, income, health, and, and, and all the things that we cling to. There is going to come a day, Christians, unless the Lord returns first. There is going to come a day for every person in this room when everything in this life will be stripped away. And we will find out on that day what we're clinging to. And, and, and so we might as well get used to the idea that there's one thing that will never leave you nor forsake you. There's one thing that will never let you down. And that one thing is that one person, Jesus Christ. And Paul reminds us here, Christ Jesus is our hope. He doesn't say he is a hope. He is the hope. He is our hope for all things, for all times, for all hopes. Sometimes, though, you know, again, we come back to that song, how, how prone my heart is to wander, you know. I, I, I become so fixated on the next exciting event in my life. You remember as a kid, do you remember, you remember when you would look forward to your birthday and then you'd look forward to Christmas and, and, and you know what? We have things for us even after we grow up. We may not look forward to Christmas as much as we did, but now i got Father's Day coming up, you know, and, I, and there's some fun stuff there to look forward to, you know, some presents and things like that, or we're looking forward to our vacation, or I'm looking forward to... And, you know, there's nothing wrong with looking forward to things, but we actually, we actually begin to hope in those things. And we start looking forward to the next great event as if, you know, it's what's going to keep us going. I think Paul is kind of saying here, Christ Jesus is what keeps me going. Now, I want you to note here that Paul refers to himself here as an apostle. The word apostle in the Greek means one sent forth. In fact, it literally means the sent forth one. And an apostle is a messenger or an envoy. In Christianity, an apostle was someone commissioned to go out to bring the good news, to establish churches, and so forth. It is a term that we didn't make up. And I'm so glad about that. You know, I like like all that. I I like the fact that, in fact, I think we need to shy away from made-up terms, don't you? Terms that we've made up because of tradition or something like that. Uh, Jesus came up with the term uh, uh, apostle. In fact, I'm going to show you a couple of scriptures here, starting in Mark chapter 3. It says here, he, and that's Jesus, appointed 12, designating them apostles, that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and have authority to drive out demons. Now, I want you to note here in this scripture, in Mark chapter 3, it says that Jesus designated these guys the sent forth ones. 
But he didn't just send them out. He gave them authority. He gave them authority to go out and do what they were supposed to do. And that is the other definition of the word apostle. It doesn't just mean someone sent forth. It means someone sent forth with authority. Okay, That is what is contained in that one Greek word, apostle. All right? um, in the sense of being sent forth, Jesus is also considered an apostle. Look on the screen from Hebrews 3.1. It says, Therefore, holy brothers who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus, the what? The apostle and high priest whom we confess. And of course... After his resurrection, Jesus then commissioned his disciples. Look here on the slide from John 20, 21. This is a scripture we recently went through and we, as we studied through John. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. So as I have received an apostolic ministry, Jesus says, I bequeath to you an apostolic ministry. All right. So, so this, is, this is what the word apostle uh, kind of means. Sent forth to proclaim the gospel with authority. Some people might wonder what the difference is between an apostle and an evangelist. An evangelist isn't necessarily sent out. They are someone who is gifted with sharing the gospel, and that's all they really want to do. They love to share the gospel wherever they are. Um, I I think of them visually as people who are just, they want to run into a burning building and save people before the thing collapses. I I think of them as people in a boat uh, grabbing drowning victims right before they go under and throwing them into the boat. Now, an evangelist, unless they're a teacher, doesn't usually have the ability to bring them along in their faith, but they'll bring them to that place of decision and, and, and encourage them. And that is the ministry of the evangelist. Now, the apostle had to have an evangelical heart, okay? But he wasn't necessarily an evangelist. He was an apostle sent forth to proclaim the gospel, but one who had authority. Do we still have apostles in the church today? Absolutely. In some cases, we call them missionaries. But, uh, you know, those who are sent forth with authority to proclaim the gospel, start churches, and have a heart to just go out and do that would uh, very much fit the uh, description and the title of an apostle. Well, that was verse 1. Verse 2. To Timothy, my true son in the faith. Paul refers to Timothy as his true son, not in the biological sense, but in rather the spiritual sense. He met Timothy on his second missionary journey as he was going through Lystra and recognized that he was a man of some integrity and so forth. And Paul took him under his wing and began to disciple him. Paul was a father to Timothy. And that's why he calls him his true son. And then he says to Timothy this, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, this is a fairly standard greeting that would go along with letters, particularly Christian letters of that era, but it is, it is still very rich with meaning. Notice Paul begins by saying, grace to you. This is, a, this is a wish, grace to you. What is grace? Grace is that which we uh, do not deserve, but that which we receive nonetheless, okay? It's favor from God given to us apart from our earning it. So when you're wishing grace to someone, you're basically saying, may you enjoy the blessings of God that you don't deserve. And no, it's not a diss. They're not saying that to kind of say, in essence, you don't deserve anything, but I hope you get something. No. It's an understanding, frankly, that none of us deserve the blessings of the Lord, but that God gives them to us anyway, apart from deserving them. And so to wish grace is to wish the abundance of God's blessings that are not deserved. Then, so that's the positive, receive the blessings of the Lord. But then he goes on to say, mercy. Mercy is different from grace, whereas grace is getting a blessing that we don't deserve. Mercy 
is not getting what we do deserve. And, and what, we, what, what we think about when we hear the word mercy is the fact that by nature we are all objects of wrath. Now, that may not be a fun thing to think about, but it's, it's biblical, it's true. By nature, we are objects of wrath. But does God give us His wrath? No, He does not give us His wrath. He gives us blessings instead. He gives us grace. Okay, so mercy means not getting what I do deserve. I deserve judgment, but I don't get it. That's mercy. Finally, He says, Peace. And this was a common Jewish greeting. It was also used in the farewell. And it was it is the word essentially shalom uh, in, in the Hebrew. So, uh, you know, you'd come into someone's house and you'd say shalom, peace. May there be peace. Peace was a wish that was given to someone for various reasons. Maybe we were at war. Maybe, you know, so we say to one another, may we have peace, you know. May you have peace. But it also could speak of an inward sort of a condition. To say to someone, may you be at peace. Now, we talked about this last Sunday. For those of you that were here uh, right before Christmas, we talked about the fact that the angels proclaimed peace on earth when they declared the birth of Christ to the shepherds who were watching over their flocks. And we also talked about the fact that we haven't really seen that peace in the world. But what the angels were talking about was peace between God and men. Well, how do we have that peace? Well, we know how we get peace. It's by coming to Christ, repenting of our sins, accepting His forgiveness, and now we have peace with God. So you see, that is why peace is at the end of Paul's greeting. Peace is the byproduct of grace and mercy. You can't have peace with God until there is peace with God. There must you must be brought to a place of peace and you will never have peace with God until you accept his peace agreement. And his peace agreement is Jesus Christ his son who he sent to die for you that he might bear the penalty of your sin, die bearing that penalty and then be raised again. If you and I put our faith in him and what he accomplished through Christ Suddenly there's peace. We have peace with God. There isn't that agitation and tension anymore in our relationship with God. Because of grace, receiving what we don't deserve. Because of mercy, not receiving what we do deserve. We now have peace. So you see, he never starts off and says, peace and grace to you. He always says grace and peace. Because peace is the byproduct of grace. Okay? Very important. Verse 3. As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus so that you may command certain men not to teach false doctrines any longer, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. These promote controversies rather than God's work, which is by faith. Well, we learn uh, a bit from these couple of verses. We learn that Paul was with Timothy in Ephesus, but he left Timothy in Ephesus to go on to Macedonia so that Timothy might stay there and deal with people who were attempting to propagate false doctrines, or as the NASB puts it, strange doctrines. And Timothy was to command these individuals to cease and desist. Did you notice there? Did you notice in verse 3, Paul says to Timothy, you are to command certain men to no longer speak these false doctrines. Okay? Now, how does a guy like Timothy get around to commanding people? That's the authority. Remember the apostolic ministry? One sent forth with authority. The authority to do what? Sometimes command. Say, stop it. Stop speaking that. And if they, if that person will not follow the direction of the Lord, then he even has the authority to you know, put them out of the fellowship because they're causing more trouble than anything else. So that's the authority. So uh, Timothy was to command them not to devote themselves to myths, which your Bible may even say fables, and endless genealogies. We don't really know what those endless genealogies are all about except that people sometimes like to find out 
you know, about their family line and see if maybe there's some nobility there. Uh, my parents sent me our, our family lineage a number of years ago. Uh, and we were traced back to, and it wasn't hard to do, we were traced back to England and then, and then of course, France. Um, and there was some notation at the end of this genealogical record that my parents sent me that said that we're not sure, but uh, our family line uh, may have descended from, you know, kings and queens, you know, as if it makes any difference. You know what I mean? But, I mean, what if you found out that you were descended from royal line? I mean, would it change who you are? I mean, you're still who you are. And, and you still need Jesus Christ as much as you did before you found out that you were of noble birth. Um, I don't know if you saw it in the news, but there's a guy who lives in, like, New Jersey. I don't know if you saw this, but he found out that he is a, in a succession of some kingly line from some little island off the coast of nowhere. And, and it's probably true, you know. I mean, and he actually had a coronation service and crowned himself king. And he still lives in the United States. Works probably in a factory somewhere in New Jersey. Probably talks like that too, you know, like those people from New Jersey. And yet, he's a king. He's a king. Well, guess what? He's still got to go to work, you know, and, and earn a living. And, and he probably still talks funny, even though he's a king. So, you know, what does it change? So endless genealogy. So you find out maybe you are of noble birth. You still need to come to the one who is king of all kings and find him and find mercy and grace at the throne of grace, you know. So, and, and Paul says here in verse 6 that, um, whoop, 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 excuse me, back up. Verse 5, he says, the goal of this command is love, which comes from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. Here's what Paul's saying to Timothy. Paul, he's saying, Timothy, I'm telling you to command these men to no longer speak false doctrines. But here's the goal, Tim. I'm not telling you to do this so that people are going to see that you're the big shot, you're the guy who's in charge, you're the big mucky muck, and boy, they better toe the line or you're going to have something to say about it. That's not, that's not what we're doing here, Tim. The goal of what I'm telling you to do is based in love. To love these people, to love the flock, to love the sheep in such a way that, you know, you're willing sometimes to get rid of some wolves that might find their way into the sheepfold. Sometimes you have to do that. But that isn't so you can flex your spiritual muscle and be seen as everybody as the, you know, he's the big guy that chases off wolves. No, the goal of this command is love, to love the people. And he says in verse 6, some have wandered away from these. And these refers to a pure heart, a good conscience, and sincere faith. And what have they turned to? They've turned to meaningless or your Bible may say, idle talk. Or as the New American Standard Bible has it, fruitless discussion. Have you ever been involved in a fruitless discussion? Unfortunately, sometimes it happens during Bible studies. And then it's really sad. And, and somebody kind of gets off on a rabbit trail, and you can tell that it's going nowhere. And it's just, it's fruitless. I mean, there's no purpose to it. There's no edifying benefit to what we're talking about here. And, and, and we have to be very careful, Christians, that we, 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 don't, we don't do that. Paul zeroes in on the desires of these people who are involved in all this meaningless talk in verse 7. And here's what he says. They want to be teachers of the law. That's what's going on in their hearts. They, they really don't want to be servants. They don't, they don't want to be humble. They want to be teachers. They want to be seen as respected teachers of the law. But Paul says here in verse 7, they don't even know what they're talking about or, or, or even of anything about what they so confidently affirm. So here they are. They, wanna, they want people to think, and I'm a teacher of the law, meaning the law of God given in the Old Testament. I know the law. And people, you know, if you can lay down the law, don't you, isn't that a sense of power? You know, I'm going to lay down the law sort of a thing, you know. And see, if I can do that, that means I'm in charge. And you have to kind of kowtow to my authority. So I'm going to lay down the law. And so these guys wanted to be teachers of the law, to be able to lay down the law and make, and make people think that, you know, they're authoritative. But Paul says they don't know what they're talking about. And they're misusing the law. 
Look what he says in verse 8, because guys, if this isn't underlined in your Bible, it probably should be. This is a vital statement. Paul says this, We know that the law is good if one uses it properly. Okay? This is so important, you guys. Here's, Here's why it's important. If we don't understand that there is a proper use to the law and there are improper uses to the law, we could potentially end up in a church where they're using the law or some form of legalism or rules keeping to browbeat us and, and, and make us think that somehow by keeping rules, we are more acceptable to God. And that's called Christianity on a performance track. And we've talked about that many times before. And believe me, Christians get caught up in performance track mentalities. If you need proof of that, just read the book of Galatians. Paul wrote that entire book to a group of churches in the region of Galatia who were being dragged down the path of legalism. They were Christians who who believed all the simplicities of what it means to be a Christian. Accepting Christ as my Savior. Believing that He died for me on the cross. Being, you know, and so on and so on. I'm a Christian. But somebody came along and started saying, yeah, well, that's all good and fine, but you also got to do this. And you got to do this. And you got to... And they started making them say, you got to keep certain days of the week. There are days, you know, that are more holy than others. Oh, and boy, when people tell you that, it sounds very convincing. And they'll, they'll quote a couple of scriptures a little off context, a little, you know, to kind of tell you, if you don't do it on this day, you're really not as acceptable to God as if you worshiped on this day. And, he, and you really have to do your hair like this and you really got to wear this and you, and you got to, and by the way, Christians don't do that. <laughs> whatever you're doing there, sort of a thing, you know, or this or that or whatever, you know, we don't do it. You know, if you want to really, you got to just, you got to do this. And you never do this and you got to do that. And, 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 and pretty soon you're loaded down with all these rules and regulations. And they start telling you this is Christianity. And real Christians, you know, raise their hands like this, not like this. All right? You know, and, and real Christians only study this one specific version of the Bible. And everybody else is wrong. And, and, it, and it never ends. It never ends. So... What is the proper use of the law? What is its proper use? Does the law have a proper use? Yeah, Paul said so. We know that the law is good as long as you, if one uses it properly. I want to show you some scriptures here. From Romans, first of all, chapter 7. Look at this. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? No, certainly not. Indeed, here's the point. I would not have known what sin was except through the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said to me, do not covet. So what is the, what's, what are the proper uses of the law? It makes us aware of the fact that we're sinners. That's an appropriate use of the law. He goes on in Romans chapter 3 to say, therefore no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather through the law, we what? Become conscious of sin. Does he ever say through the law we, may, or we are brought close to God? No, never. Never. In fact, he says here, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. But what does the law do? It makes us conscious of sin. And then finally from Galatians chapter 3. So the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. What's the, fu- the function of the law? It was put in charge to lead us to Christ. But what happens once you come to Christ? Then what's the function of the law? You're no longer under the law. You then are led by the Spirit. The law can only bring you to the point of understanding you're a sinner. After you're a Christian, after you come to Jesus, now it's the work of the Spirit to carry on that ministry. The law can't make you wise unto salvation. The law can't make you mature. Rules and regulations can't mature you in Christ. Okay? So what then is the improper use of the law? Well, again, I could probably refer to you just to the book of Galatians. I mean, read the book. Paul basically writes to these people telling them that they have have embraced an improper 
uh, approach to the law because they believed the law was going to make them more acceptable to God. But what I am going to share with you are some scriptures here, again, from Romans 9. Look on the big screen. It says, what, shall, what then shall we say? That the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness, they weren't even looking for righteousness, they've obtained it, a righteousness that is by faith. But Israel who pursued a law of righteousness has not attained it. Why not? Because they pursued it not by faith, but as if it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. What's Paul saying here? He's explaining that the Gentiles, they weren't even looking for righteousness. Righteousness? Why do I want to be righteous? They, they, but they found it because they found it by faith. We are righteous by faith in Jesus Christ, okay? In other words, God sees you as righteous by faith, by faith, by faith, not by works. But the Jews sought to be righteous by God, to, uh, before God by doing good things, keeping the law. And they stumbled and they didn't find what they were looking for. Why? Because that is an improper use of the law. You cannot get closer to God. You cannot be made righteous by keeping the law, by rules and regulations. I don't care how you do your hair, what clothes you wear, what day of the week you worship on. I don't care. It does not bring you any closer to God. By not eating this food, by eating this food, by not doing this, by doing this, you can't be made closer to God by keeping rules. That's what Paul is saying here. So who was the law meant for? Look at verse 9 here in 1 Timothy. Verse 9. We also know that law is not made not for the righteous. Now, again, I want you to know something. If you are in Jesus today, you are righteous. That means you're in right standing with God. Why? Because you're a good person? No, 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 no. Because Jesus is a good person and because he forgave you of your sins and extended his righteousness to you. So you are righteous. Okay? If you're in Jesus today, you are righteous before God. What does Paul say here about the law? It wasn't made for you. It wasn't made for the righteous. It was only made to bring you to the place of coming to Christ. But now that you've come to the to come to Christ, it's not for you. Who is it for? Look what he goes on to say in verse 9. It's for lawbreakers. It's for rebels the ungodly and sinful, the unholy and irreligious for those who kill their fathers or mothers, for murderers, for adulterers and perverts. By the way, let me stop here just for a moment and just say, the word pervert in the Bible is not anything close to what we've made it into. Okay, It's become a very derogatory term. The word pervert comes from perversion, which means to twist an original design. In God's economy, anything that is twisted beyond God's original creative design has been perverted. Okay? It's been tweaked. It was never meant to be a derogatory term. And way too often, I hear Christians using the word pervert to describe certain people. It ought never cross our lips in that manner. And it breaks my heart to hear it happen. So let's make sure nobody at Calvary Chapel uses that word to describe anybody. It describes, you know what? And here's why. Fundamentally, it describes all of us. Because there's not one of us in this room who hasn't lived some form of God's will in a twisted way. Okay? We've perverted just about everything known to man that came from God. So in that sense of the word, every one of us is a pervert. Let's not use it ever in a derogatory way. It it sounds, well, it shouldn't be be passing our lips in that way. We ought to to bless and not curse. So so the, the, the word in the scripture has a very specific meaning. He goes on to say that the law is also for slave traders and liars and perjurers, those who lie under oath, and for whatever else is contrary to the sound doctrine that conforms to the glorious gospel of the blessed God which He entrusted to me. I want to close here this morning by uh, taking you over to Galatians chapter 5. So would you turn there, please? And, And the reason I'm going to take you there is because... I want you to see something that the Apostle Paul says, which is said in so much 
better than I could ever hope to say it, um, about our relationship to the law now that we are Christians. You know, I don't think there's anything wrong with loving the law in the sense that... But, you know, I see some people trying to fight for the rights of having the Ten Commandments on this or that property or whatever. And I understand the idea that we don't want to let government, you know, dictate to us when and where we can declare the Word of God. In that sense of the argument, I think it's valid. But, but Christians, don't ever forget what the law does to people, okay? The law kills people, okay? It kills them. Paul says that. He says, when I, when I heard the law, I died. I was condemned. The law condemns people. And it can't save them. Jesus saves people. All the law does, I've told you this, how many times have I told you, the law is like your bathroom scale. All it does is tell you how much weight you need to lose. The law simply tells you how, you know, far short you've fallen of the grace of God. That's all it can do. So, please understand that. Galatians chapter 5, beginning of verse 14. Paul writes, the entire law is summed up in a single command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. That's what people do who are living under the law, by the way. They bite and they devour. So I say, live by the law? No. Live by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature or the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the spirit, look at this, guys, you are not under law. Okay? The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. And then he mentions them there. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, which is a giving oneself over to sensual pleasure, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit... Now he says, here's what the Spirit produces in our life. Love is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And then this last line is so very important. Against such things, there is no law. So you see, if we're walking in the Spirit, there is no law. The law isn't for you anymore. The law did its job. It brought you to Christ. It revealed to you your need of a Savior. But now you follow the Spirit. And the Spirit leads us in accordance with the Word. Amen? Let's stand together and we'll close in prayer. If you have any prayer needs that are weighing on your heart this morning, anything that just you, you just need somebody this morning to kind of agree with you in prayer about whatever it is that's uh, burdening you. Um, please come on up after the service and uh, let us just agree with you in prayer, so that you can just know today before you leave that um, you know we brought that to the throne of grace and left it there. Amen. Let's pray. Jesus, we love you so much. And we're just amazed and blown away by your love for us that you would come as a man and and bear our penalty. Absolutely just blows our minds. Such awesome love, we don't even know what to do with it. We don't even know how to categorize it in our lives. We're amazed. And we thank you for it. We thank you, Lord, for your calling. Upon our lives, we thank You for the work You're doing in us. We thank You, Lord, for the surety of Your grace. The assurance that we are also receiving mercy. And the benefit of peace that comes from knowing that the tension between us and God has been eliminated by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Thank You so much, Lord for grace, for mercy, and for peace. And thank You, Lord God, that we are not under law, 
But instead we walk in grace to live by the Spirit, to follow the direction of the Spirit as He speaks to us in accordance with Your Word. Fill our hearts now with every good thing and lead us in the way that is right, for we commit our hearts to You. In the name of our Savior, our hope, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a good rest of your day.